Mbena and her young daughter, always in tow, set out from Ndom uh, village here and make their way by foot, of course, to Bengal. We don't know why, however, Ndombe women regularly made this trek to sell agricultural produce in Bengal to sustain the city, but also the slave ships that were departing. And on a subsequent occasion, as we will see, Nbena made the same trip for exactly this reason. She was thus probably part of a small army of enterprising uh, Ndombe women who sold agricultural products that staved off starvation in Bengal. However, the road to and from Bengala was anything but safe, even for regular travelers like Mbena, whose services helped to sustain the port town. Effectively, Ndombe women were often robbed along the way and sometimes suffered worst, worst transgressions. Not long after Mbena left her village in late May or early, uh, in that early, uh, pardon me, in that late May, early June morning, she encounters an old, frail slave woman who worked on a nearby agricultural estate. The southern banks of the Kutumbela River were full of agricultural estates. It's certainly one of these. The said agricultural estate was owned by Lieutenant Colonel Sacramento. The same man who played a major role in Zemanuel's life. Somehow, this old female slave convinced Mbena to follow her to the estate house, where she introduced Mbena to Sacramento's wife. Advancing years, tired of laboring as a field hand, field, field hand, the female slave told her mistress that because she was now too old, too old to be useful, she had brought the much younger Benna to replace her. Hence, Benna and her daughter had been conned into slavery. The following day, Benna was given an axe and forced to work on Sacramento's estate. But born as a free woman, she would, none, she would have none of this imposed servitude. That very same day that she was forced to work on Sacramento's estate, there's an opportunity that arises and she takes off from the estate with her daughter. She flees. She's a runaway. Across country that she knew quite well, Nbena headed straight for the secure world of her village. Once there, she returns to life as a free person, living amongst her relatives, amongst her possessions, that ironically included her own slaves. Nonetheless, Mbena's brief experience as a slave adds care to her, and she does not leave her village for, for quite some months. But then late November, early December 1817, her apprehension either dissipates or is perhaps overridden by other issues. So early another morning, Mbena sets out for Bengala to sell produce again with her daughter. This time, the trip goes unimpeded. Mbena, with her daughter tagging along, arrives safely in Bengala to go about their business. But someone recognizes her as a fugitive from the Sacramento estate. Word is quickly sent to Sacramento, who happened to be in town. Suddenly, a few of his trusted slaves encircle Mbena and her daughter 
and kidnapped them. Sacrament loses little time in dealing with this recaptured runaway. He has been branded right on the spot and then sells her and her daughter for 70 reis to a fellow by the name of Juan de Oliveira Diaz, captain of the uh, Estrella, a Lisbon vessel that is just about to make the crossing uh, into uh, uh, the Atlantic via Luanda. We bring in Luanda into the picture now. Bena and their daughter, in other words, were poised to experience the Atlantic crossing. News of Mbena's ab uh, um, abduction, her sail to Captain Diaz, and forced departure for Luanda very quickly reaches her village. Alarmed by this news, relatives quickly mobilize and head for Bengala. A few hours later, a large number of people descend upon the town's military headquarters. Amongst them are five or six Ndombe Savas, one of them who, one of them uh, being the Bena's uncle. Now these folks don't come to town to ransom Bena, not at all. Rather, they create a great up uproar, clamoring in favor of Mbena, complaining about their unlawful enslavement, and demanding justice from the government. For Melui Alvin, the governor, such a large number of rowdy people was a frightening scene. But their cause was also nothing short of disturbing. So he decides to look into the matter. An even larger crowd assembles in front of Bengala's military quarters the following day to see how the hearing unfolds. First, Melui Alvi calls Istandala, his translator, as well as other people in Bengala who had exercised the same function. He then summons the plaintiffs, including Bena's relations, the Ndombe chiefs, and a number of other witnesses. All of these people are unanimous in their dispositions. Mbena was born as a free woman and had lived as such until her recent abduction. She was not a slave and had been wrongly enslaved. So thereupon, the governor asks Lieutenant Colonel Sacrament to answer these allegations. And the only thing that Sacrament says is that Mbena had been brought several, seven months before to his household by an old female slave as uh, her uh, replacement and that she had subsequently fled after which he ordered his slaves to recapture her and then sold her to Captain Diaz, Captain of the Estrella. Without further proof, Governor Melui Alvi rules this to be an extremely scandalous matter and decides in favor of Mbena. He orders Sacramento to have Mbena and her daughter returned all the way from Luanda without delay and at his own expense. Appraised of the decision, the crowd, including Mbena's relatives, disperse peacefully, peacefully but hoping, of course, for the best. Were the unfortunate Mbana and her daughter still in Rwanda? Or were they already on the Atlantic crossing headed for Brazil? Equally important, would Sacrament keep his word to make sure that both Mbana and her daughter were effectively returned to Bengala? Melui Alvi immediately writes the governor of Angola stationed in Rwanda, Luis de, uh, de Matafeu y Torres, who happens to be Melu Alvin's immediate support, uh, superior with all of the details of the case. And he requests that Matafeu take the necessary measures so that, so that that Negro female returns to Bengala from the authority of the captain who bought her or from wherever she may be. 
Mel Yelvin's letter arrives in Luanda quickly. As it happens, they were, uh, uh, Ben and her daughter were still the property of Captain Diaz, and the Estrella had still not yet sailed for Brazil. Mata Fell, the governor of Angola, very quickly orders Captain Diaz to comply with the request of the governor of Benguela. In late 1817, the governor of Angola lets Melu Alvin know that Ben and her daughter have been freed and they're sent, they've been sent back to Benguela, where they arrive early the following year. Barely, just barely, did Mbena Ben and her daughter escape from being sent to the hell for blacks as Brazil was known.